Hi, everybody. Um, okay, so we're into the 16th week of this course. Um, believe it or not, we still haven't talked about calibrating models or, or algorithms or anything like that. Uh, but I hope that will get across to everybody the importance of, of getting ready before you run those models. And so one of the things that we're talking about um, last week and this week is this idea of distributional equilibrium and, and the BAM diagram. And so what I want to do for this week is um, present to you, first of all, some uh, research results about what configurations of the BAM diagram will lend themselves to fitting good models and which ones will not but also then show you some examples, concrete examples of different configurations of the BAM diagram. So I hope you'll bear with us, uh, me, with me and all the other instructors, that we really do want to, to take time to do all these considerations of data quality and uh, data preparation and concepts and things like that before we get around to fitting models. Um, I think that it's the best way for you to do your business as well as you move into this field of, of distributional ecology. Okay, so let's go into the presentation. And okay, so in this first presentation, what I want to talk to you about is, is BAM configurations. And I'll start by emphasizing uh, this is a heuristic, which is to say, it's a teaching and thinking tool. It is not uh, anything that you can estimate or be precise about. It's just a way of thinking about things that are hard to, to think about without a framework like this. Now, I've already talked with you about uh, the origins of the BAM diagram. Uh, I'll go over this just a little bit uh, in case you've forgotten. Uh, or in case uh, a refresher would be useful. Uh, this is Joseph Grinnell, and he's the person who put the idea of ecological niche kind of out there in its modern concept um, in the scientific literature. And um, Grinnell was quite a forward thinker. Um, and basically, suffice it to say that he got this, this idea of what we call the Hutchinsonian duality, where a species has a geographic distribution, but that geographic distribution is also manifested in environmental dimensions. And those environmental dimensions are perhaps what constrain the geography. Grinnell got that and gave us a nice list of um, environmental factors or environmental dimensions that may or may not limit the distribution of a species. And as I talked about before, um, these things got more complicated. Actually, within a decade of, of Grinnell's original uh, use of these terms, uh, along comes Charles Elton. And instead of talking about niche in the sense of environmental constraints or environmental requirements, uh, Elton began talking about niche uh, as regards the, the role of a species in a community. And that, that did confuse things, and it does confuse things um, up until today. Now, we began to get a little bit of clarity um, when along comes G. Evelyn Hutchinson, and um, in a in a set of remarks that I'll show you in a moment, uh, Hutchinson made a first step towards clarifying the situation by referring to um, bionomic and senopoetic variables. And this is essentially what informally we, we call biotic and abiotic variables now. But Hutchinson, let's say, had a, had a knack for using difficult terminology um, sometimes to the point of kind of obscuring what he was trying to say, but he did make an extremely useful uh, distinction between these two kinds of, of variables. Um, so there's 
Hutchinson's concluding remarks. It's about the most um, uninformative title possible. Um, and you'll see, I'll, I'll put this on the, the site for the, the course. You will see that uh, his, his uh, writing is not the most accessible writing there is. Um, but this is a, a crucially important um, piece of, of commentary or piece of thinking about uh, distribution and niche and things like that. And there were a bunch of other people who contributed importantly to this, um, Robert MacArthur, for example. Um, but here's a next big step um, by Ron Pulliam in a, in a review titled On the Relationship Between This Niche and Distribution. And amongst other things that he does in this review, um, one of the things he points out is that um, species don't have universal access to all of the conditions that might make up their ecological niches. And then a few years after that, uh, Jorge Soberon and I um, posited what we call the BAM diagram now. Uh, but essentially what we're talking about is this interplay between um, senopoetic or abiotic dimensions, A in the BAM diagram, uh, bionomic dimensions, B in the BAM diagram, and this additional concept that Pulliam brought in, which was uh, the idea of, of limited access to places. And so that mirrors into the M in the BAM diagram. We have to remember that niche thinking is about environmental spaces and BAM is cast in geographic dimensions. BAM is essentially a set of maps. But let's, let's go into this a bit more and kind of remember some of these concepts, but also talk about uh, different configurations of the BAM more than we have before. So let's talk about areas of distribution. Now, first of all, we have this fairly poorly defined area that's kind of the, the overall area that could be interesting to us. And within that area, which we call G, is this sub-area, which is called A, which is the set of places, again, this is a map, it's a set of places that meet the species physiological requirements. So this is A in the BAM diagram. And yeah, these are the places that fit within the species uh, set of tolerance limits um, mapped out across geography. These are the places that work um, for the species. These are the places that fall within an environmental space within the fundamental ecological niche. Now, Hutchinson brought in this, this additional concept uh, of, the, of separating out the biotic dimensions or the bionomic dimensions. And those of you who have taken introductory ecology will remember a set of diagrams like this from Hutchinson, which were about the fundamental niche and the realized niche and the reduction from fundamental to realized uh, is by this biotic dimension. Um, this diagram, which is not an environmental space, it's not niches, but this diagram uh, shows a reduction, a potential for reduction of the geographic range of the species uh, from its abiotic potential to its more realistic, um, biotically reduced potential. Now, definitely, definitely, and we've talked about this before, if there are positive interactions, then the idea of using a Venn diagram like we've used here doesn't work because in effect, the overlap between A and B could be larger than A, okay? But we're gonna neglect those, those sorts of interactions on geographic scales for the time being. Now, this area of overlap is the area that is habitable by the species both in terms of abiotic dimensions and in terms of biotic dimensions. And so this is an interesting area that has interesting qualities. But we have to bring in 
this third circle. You guys are probably tired of this by now, but it's the 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 set of sites that are accessible to the species by dispersal. You heard a lot of thinking about that last week from Jorge and Fernando. Um, but the M circle is a is a reduction, uh, a further reduction of the A and B um, parts of the world. And so M essentially splits up that potential distribution that we talked about a moment ago into an area that is accessible. And so we call that, that hatched area in the middle the occupied area. And then this other area is called the uh, invadable area. And so we've kind of divided the, the, the world up, or G up, into different kinds of uh, distributional areas. And just to give you a little bit of repetition, and you well know this by now, uh, A reflects the ecological niche, the fundamental niche, uh, and the species ph physiological requirements. It's cast in terms of non-interactive, uncoupled variables, um, and it's roughly independent of interactions with other species, and it has low spatial resolution, which is to say it's coarse uh, spatially. B, on the other hand, is biotic inter interactions, requirements, and impacts. The variables that, that determine B are interactive and are dynamically coupled, and uh, B is cast at pretty high resolution, so fine uh, spatial and temporal resolutions. And as I just mentioned, Hutchinson um, pointed out this, this difference between um, A and B and the, the, var the environmental variables that determine them. Um, and unfortunately, that distinction was forgotten for a number of years until people like Austin and Beglon and Jackson and Overpeck and others came along and, and rethought about it and, and uh, revived those points. Now going back to M, as you've heard about from, from Fernando and from um, Jorge last week, um, we have to think about M as a set of barriers. And you can think about what those barriers might be um, you know, high mountain ranges or deep valleys or rivers or oceans, etc. So now we have this BAM configuration, and for probably bad reasons, Jorge and I chose to present it as this series of overlapping rings, kind of like the, the Olympic symbol. Um, and that really was probably unfortunate because it took people away from thinking about this as being manifested in, in, in geographic space, and it suggested indirectly and tacitly that this was manifested in environmental space. So I'll apologize for us for that one. Uh, we probably should have used irregular uh, shapes that looked more like areas on a map. But one thing we have to say about Hutchinson, much as he, he made positive contr contributions, he never thought much or he never wrote much about the accessibility dimension. Uh, Jorge says he's found the sentence in, in Hutchinson's textbook uh, where he mentions the fact that not all places and not all sets of conditions are accessible to each species. Uh, but really, if you read Hutchinson's thinking, um, he, was, he was seeing the world this way, where the accessibility is quite broad, and really all you need to think about is the abiotic and, and biotic. Now, most of you will know who this is. Um, it's our good friend, Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, and Wallace probably would have thought, or at least this is the, 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 the thought that uh, my colleagues and I had, um, that Wallace would have seen Hutchinson as needing to get out and see the world. Here's what Wallace did. This is um, 
the Malay archipelago. Uh, Southeast Asia is here, and here's Sumatra, Java, um, Sulawesi, Borneo, uh, the Lesser Sundas, the Philippines, and many of you know this diagram because this is the diagram that uh, that first um, made explicit, or most of us have seen as making explicit what's called Wallace's line, which is the great and amazing um, break between Eurasia to the left and uh, Aust the Australo Australopopuan region to the right. Um, but these red lines, that those show Wallace's travels. And Wallace zoomed around this region uh, pretty impressively. And what that does is it, it, it teaches him or it taught him uh, about distributional limitation and why species aren't everywhere. And so Wallace might have looked at uh, the world quite differently. Wallace might have said, ah, forget about abiotic limitations as limiting species distributions and structuring their distributions. What really matters is access. And so Wallace saw the world quite differently. Remember, Hutchinson really didn't pay attention to this circle. And instead, Hutchinson was very focused on, on these other two circles. So we have two very, very contrasting views of the world. Um, now we can bring in another modification, which is this idea that, that uh, Jorge Soberon and several others and I put out a few years ago, we call it the Eltonian noise hypothesis. And this is not, a, not intended as a slight to Charles Elton, although he could have been crea more creative in, in picking words and not recycling Grinnell's idea of niche. Um, but what this is about is that um, we explore the idea that um, Eltonian interactions, uh, Eltonian signals, which is to say biotic interactions, are manifested on very fine and local scales. And they may not have much to do with geographic distributions. We've talked about this before. I don't want to go back over it. But suffice it to say that the BAM diagram in an Eltonian noise world looks quite different. The BAM diagram has B as the big circle, and then we have the abiotic and the accessible portions. So, so this, is, this is, again, a lot of ways that we could rearrange these circles. Now, um, maybe it's because I was trained as a biogeographer way back when, but I guess I, I do believe in the primacy of, of M. Um, and maybe this map will illustrate why for you. This is a environmental space corresponding to the Americas. And this is an ellipse that roughly uh, encompasses what we would call uh, dry tropical forest, uh, or at least one version of it. And what I want you to see is that it has manifestations along the west coast of Mexico, in northeastern Brazil in the, in the formation called the Kachinga, in uh, northwestern South America and northern South America, bits of Central America, and even on the east coast of Mexico. And all I want to show you is, and I think I've talked about this with you all before, but I just want to show you that M may be, a, may be primary or, or dominant because there are lots and lots of endemic species that are found only in one of these areas, lots of them. But I don't know of any one of any species that's endemic to all of these. And so my feeling is that the, the suitability in terms of environment is one dimension, but really species originate in a particular area. That sounds like M thinking. And that they adapt to speciate in uh, a particular area because of their origin there. But that, that's more of an opinion. 
So I'm not going to belabor that point. What I do want to show you is this paper. Um, it was led by Aaron Saup, whom you've heard from, and Corey Myers and Jorge Soberon, uh, Hannah Owens. So a bunch of people that, that are giving talks in this course. Uh, but I want, what I want you to see is this, this, um, this set of results that we obtained. So notice the need for a priori assessment of key causal factors. Well, what we're talking about here is the configuration of the BAM diagram. So we're going to start with an Eltonian noise world. So notice that B is big and that A and M are smaller. And in a Venn diagram world, big means not restrictive and small means restrictive or important. So here A and M are the important things. And we're going to posit four different um, topologies or, or arrangements of those two uh, circles. So um, our classic BAM arrangement is when um, the accessible area and the um, habitable area are overlapping, kind of like the, the, um, the Olympic circles. But Wallace's dream would be this one where the accessible area is a subset of the habitable area. Hutchinson's dream would be where the accessible, sorry, where the accessible area is big and the habitable area is what determines the, the range of the species. And then we can explore a fourth configuration where the two coincide. And I'm going to give you real examples of this in the next talk, so bear with me. But suffice it to say that in this paper, what we did was we, we created species that were classic BAM or this fourth um, configuration, which we call all OK, or these intermediate ones, um, which either place um, the accessible area as a, substitute, a subset of the habitable area, or vice versa. We created uh, versions of each of those. And then we did some uh, model fitting, and we asked, in which of these cases can we get, get a good model out? And so here are the four um, configurations of the BAM diagram. I'm not going to go into great detail on, on what this is, but it's a matching statistic called kappa. And we're essentially asking, how well does our model match to um, the known occupied area or the known uh, potential area for each of these four uh, configurations of BAM. What I want you to see is that out here near one is perfect matching and down here near zero is perfectly bad matching or perfectly random. What I want you to see is that classic BAM and Hutchinson's dream get pretty far out towards that right or top edge, which is a really good model. But I also want you to see that Wallace's dream and all okay, most all of their outcomes in this, in this study cluster right around zero, zero. And so those are models that are patently random. They don't have any predictive power. And so we saw that as a pretty interesting and perhaps damning result. It says that under certain configurations of the BAM, uh, you have no possibility of fitting a good predictive model. So we came back to this a few years later. Uh, this is a, a study that was led by Hui Jie Chao with Jorge and me. Um, it was mainly about another topic, which we'll talk about later in this course, the idea of no silver bullets. Um, but we did kind of come back around to the same analysis. We created, let's say, more sophisticated um, niches, and some of them were very peripheral, and some of them were very central. Um, 
but we essentially created different BAM configurations. And all I want you to show, all, all I want you to see is that, again, this is a matching statistic against a truth. And so really good is either up here at the top or along the side or out here in the upper corner. And really bad is way down there. Um, and all I want you to see is that the um, Wallace's dream configuration is qualitatively worse than Hutchinson's dream and classic BAM. Okay, and this, this does make sense. Um, well, in Wallace's dream configurations, you don't get to see distributional limits that are set by environmental dimensions. So we have these four configurations of the BAM. And what these two studies showed was that in these two configurations, you really should think about staying away from there, right? There'd be dragons there. Um, those are situations under which you're not gonna have a good possibility of fitting a robust model with good predictive power. So that's a, that's a view of BAM configurations and how they map onto um, modeling possibilities. Um, and effectively what we, what we see is that we're gonna oftentimes neglect the biotic dimensions out of practicality, to be honest, we've talked about that before. Um, but that some of the BAM configurations um, are configurations where you have very little probability of fitting a robust model. And so we as responsible scientists ought to check the BAM configuration before we start into a modeling effort. And we ought to take very seriously the fact that some BAM configurations don't lend themselves to fitting models. So sorry to be a pessimist, um, but I think I'm a realist also. In the next talk, I'm gonna lay out for you some very real examples and uh, illustrate these, these points a bit more for you.